doubt. We all have it. But what do we do with it? Maybe you were raised as a Christian, but you haven't darkened the door of a church building in quite some time. Maybe you had a painful experience that makes trusting in God just seem so inadequate. Maybe you've read and studied your way out of and you feel like you've grown past religion and its claims. I want to invite you to join us on a journey as we ask the question, is faith credible? A meaningful faith is one that is worthy of our examination, our trust, and answers to the deepest longings of our heart. Skeptics, doubters, seekers are welcome as we ask this big question. We don't have all the answers, but we know the one who does. Join us on this walk as we search for a worthy faith. She was as sincere as can be. When she called me up, frantic. My son was raised in church. He knows better. But lately he's been expressing, I don't know what to call it, doubts. Tell me what to do. You know, for the last three weeks, I have tried to argue that the Christian faith is worthy of our trust. And if you sense that beauty, goodness, and truth are real, deep, objective things, you just may want to give belief in God a try. And if you think there's something to the resurrection of Jesus, if you think there's something to this thing called Christianity and the difference it's made in the lives of everybody we know in the Western culture, you just may want to give Christianity a try. But there's going to be people saying, I, I have an interest in what we're talking about, but I still have doubts. Is Christianity a faith worthy of my doubts? Philip Yancey calls these people believers in the borderlands. It's people who have not quite decided to make it into the community of faith, but they are very interested. Luke has his own phrase for people like this. Between those who know not God, have no hope, are lost in this world, and those who are in the community of faith, he's got a third middle category. Luke, in both the gospel and in the book of Acts, calls this group God-fearers. God-fearers. It's the way he describes Cornelius. It's the way Paul describes when he speaks in the synagogue and he says, to you men of Israel and to the God-fearers, I want to say something to you, believers in the borderland. But I'm not just interested in believers in the borderland. I think there's people in the pew, been there for 20 years, been teaching Bible class for half that time, and you wouldn't know it, but still has questions, still have doubts. Is Christianity a faith worthy of those doubts? You know, doubts come in all shapes and sizes. Maybe we're talking about intellectual doubts. Is, is God really there? Is Jesus really his son? Is Christianity true? But then we have things like spiritual doubts. Am I really a Christian? Why is it so hard to pray? Why do I still feel guilty? Maybe we're thinking about circumstantial doubts. Maybe that's what you struggle with. Why did my child die? Why didn't my marriage last? Where was God when my neighbor was abusing me? Doubt is something that virtually all of us experience, but we don't always know what to do with it. Church doesn't always know what to do with it. A few years ago, Philip Yancey was asked to sign a statement of faith for Christianity Today magazine, and he was asked to sign it, quote, without doubt or equivocation. He said, I put the pen down, and I looked at everybody in the room, and I said, I can't write my own name without doubt or equivocation. I'm shocked. I mean, I'm struck with awe about how many people in the Bible 
could relate to this. There may be people who have no doubt in their minds about anything involving the Christian faith. I just wonder if they're reading the same Bible that I'm reading. I read about doubting Thomas. I read about skeptical Abraham and laughing Sarah. I even read of a Savior who on the night he was betrayed is in a garden asking the Father if there's any other way other than the current plan. Try this exercise. Find a single argument that you've ever heard any atheist use against God that isn't already in the Bible. Life seems meaningless. That's Ecclesiastes. God can't be good or loving or even there if bad things happen to good people. That's, that's Job. Evil just seems to flourish and nothing gets done about it. That's in the Psalms, and that's Habakkuk chapter 1. My soul is crushed. I go looking for God, and every place I look, I can't find Him. That's Lamentations. I remember an episode of the Andy Griffith Show, where Opie goes to his father and says, I want to run away. Can I have permission? And Andy says, well, that's not really the kind of thing you ask permission for, Permission for, but let's talk this through. And, and he helps him think through all the things he'll need to get a clean getaway. Don't you find it amazing that God not only allows his creatures to deny him, deride him, and defy him, he provides arguments to use against him in the Bible. The Bible expresses our doubts. It expresses our waffling. In Psalm 22, the writer says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the very next chapter, the Lord is my shepherd, I don't need anything. But isn't a relationship like that? The waffling, the highs and the lows, and yet we stick it out. Was there ever a stronger believer with more conviction than John the Baptist? I mean, you had to be convicted to dress like that in public. And yet after all of his preaching, and even seeing Jesus and declaring him the Messiah at his baptism, John sits in a prison cell. And he sends his followers to go ask Jesus, Did I back the right horse? Is he really the Messiah? Should I keep looking? If there was ever a disciple who deserved the tremendous courage award, it was Thomas. I mean, when Jesus decided to go to Bethany to pay his respects, and we don't know the rest of the story, to raise Lazarus. That's getting close to Jerusalem. The last time he was headed that direction, he almost got in hot water. And so the disciples realized if he heads that direction, this might not end well. And it was Thomas who says, then let's go to that we might die with him. Thomas. You know, we call him Doubting Thomas. And he gets that name because he wanted the same assurance that all the others had. He missed the meeting. When all the others were able to see the risen Lord. And so Thomas says, unless I see the nail prints in his hands, I'm, I'm not going to believe this thing. It just seems like it can't possibly be true. I like the way Ray Pritchard puts it. He's not an unbelieving skeptic. He's a wounded believer. And this is why it's so important to recognize that doubt is not the unforgivable sin. In fact, I'm not convinced that it's a sin at all. God doesn't turn his back on questioners. He invites questioners. He honors them. He engages with those who struggle with faith and whose struggle with faith brings with it difficulties as they cry out to God about them. Why did you let this happen? How can I continue to follow you if you're going to be like this? Where are you? I don't believe this. I want you to change what you're planning to do. That can't be right. Now answer my arguments. All of that's in the Bible. Spoken by heroes of faith. 
and God uses it. Ask Job. Ask Abraham. Ask David. Questioners all. And I see it most clearly in the hurting father in Mark 9. You remember verse 24. He's got his child in his arms. He wanted somebody to help, and he brought it to the disciples, and the disciples couldn't help. But Jesus, surely you can do anything. Oh, what do you mean you can do anything, says Jesus? If you can, all things are possible to him who believes. And the father says, I believe. Help my unbelief. This may be the greatest five-word prayer in all the Bible. I have faith. Help my lack of faith. So transparent, so raw. This is the prayer of many of the people of God. I have faith struggles, but I desire a faith nonetheless. God can use passion that goes into struggling and grappling with faith. Some people think doubt is the opposite of faith. It is not. The opposite of faith is not doubt. Doubt is grappling with the questions of faith. God can use it. The opposite of faith is apathy, an unwillingness to engage, an unwillingness to care. What can God do with that? That just leads to unbelief. The Bible welcomes questions and frustrations and doubt. The trouble is that sometimes our churches don't. A recent poll came out of Great Britain that said four out of five people claim that church puts people off Christianity more than attracts them to it. How could it be possible that church could appear as a block rather than a bridge to faith to people. Well, let me give you some historical context. In 1633, the religious leaders of the day were convinced that the sun revolves around the earth. They had a lot of reasons for thinking that, but the primary reason was because they read so in their Bibles. Take a look at Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 5. It says the sun rises and the sun sets. What about Joshua 10, 13? How can Joshua command the sun to stand still if it's not already moving all around us? What about the Psalms that say repeatedly that God established the earth on its pillars and it shall not be moved? But ask any science teacher in this congregation. Ask any science major in this congregation. Ask any sixth grader, and they'll tell you, the earth revolves around the sun. And we've got a lot of people to thank for that, including Galileo. And once that was firmly established, we went back to the scriptures, and we saw things there we had never seen before. Poetic license in the Psalms. Accommodative language in Joshua. Metonymy in Ecclesiastes. Listening to what was going on outside Scripture helped us read and appreciate what was going on inside it. But it didn't happen overnight. And some good-hearted, Bible-reading, religious believers made their changes kicking and screaming. Because when Galileo was called before the tribunal in 1633, he was condemned. And in the condemnation, it said, quote, you're relying, you're, you're replying to the objections from the Holy Scriptures. You gloss the Scriptures according to your own meaning. In fact, you are teaching things that are expressly contrary to the Holy Scriptures and therefore cannot be defended or held. Thirty-five years ago, Daniel Taylor wrote a book with an interesting title. The title is The Myth of Certainty. The book is written for the questioner, the doubter, the person who always has her hand up in the back of the room. And the message of the book is this, the world and the church needs you. Because your willingness to ask tough questions will only make us better and will remind us of the Christian virtue of humility. 
you know narrow-mindedness is on every side of the divide. And in this book, Daniel Taylor reaches out to those of us sickened by overconfidence. He says, a pox on both their houses. The grandeur of the universe, the greatest minds in the history of the world, have left room for us to be less than certain about any number of things. But I want to explore, reason, think, discuss, argue in the best sense of the word. And I want to do it with someone who knows the limits of their own position. Someone aware of the strengths of the other side who can show me how to live with tension and uncertainties rather than sweeping everything under the rug like it's a magic show. I don't know about you, but that resonates with me. When I was growing up, I idolized the Bible answer man. I mean, that was my goal to be the Bible answer man. Did you know that in the Gospels, people come to Jesus with questions 153 times? You know how I know that? Bible answer man. 153 times they come to Jesus with questions. 147 of those times, 96% of the time, Jesus responds to those questions with another question. Good questions open up discussion. Good questions push us further and deeper into our investigation. Good questions allow both of us to share in the quest. And it is a quest, isn't it? In the New Testament, faith involves three elements. It begins with understanding. It leads to conviction. And then ultimately, it ends in commitment. But faith begins with understanding. Open your Bibles to Hebrews 11. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 6. Faith starts with thinking. Do you believe that? You know, telling people that they should believe what the tradition tells you to believe might be dangerous. Just because you stand in a certain place doesn't mean that you're standing on solid ground. To repeat over and over again what you've always assumed is true with tenacity and force can possibly do more harm than good. But to seek and to search and to engage in a thinking faith inevitably will bring about new and even disturbing questions. Hebrews 11, whoever comes to God must believe that he exists. That's putting your thinking cap on. But active engagement in faith issues can produce difficult questions. And that's why I like to think that doubt is not always some big danger to faith. Doubt can actually be the sign of faith. Think about it. You can't doubt something unless you already have faith about it. Do you see that doubt is a sign of faith? Struggling with God means that we're grappling with faith issues. Doubt and faith can coexist together, and doubt can often lead to greater faith. I love this line from Barbara Brown Taylor. Everyone who saw Jesus saw him after the resurrection. If it happened in a cave, it happened in complete silence and absolute darkness. New life starts in the dark. Whether it's a seed in the ground, a baby in the womb, or Jesus in the tomb, it starts in the dark. The Bible welcomes doubt. It calls for us to seek humility. What it never does is give the impression that Christians have it all figured out. Certainty is actually not one of the virtues or traits of the people of God. And sometimes church is well-meaning, of course, will act in ways that, unfortunately, to the way it's observed, look as if we want to squash doubt. We want to remove any hint of dissension. And the danger of being a certainty church, saying, don't doubt, just believe, is that you don't really resolve the doubts that come back in other ways. People come to church when they are having a crisis in their life. 
But that doesn't mean they always come ready to do whatever they're told. And believers, even the ones who say, I'm ready to do whatever the Bible tells me to do, they need instruction on how to major in majors and not major in minors. But there's no preface to the scriptures that lay all that out. And that's why healthy Christian theology is needed. Philosophical reflection, careful reasoning. This is what helps us approach scripture well. I'm convinced that conversations that only take place within the pages of scripture without reflection on why you should think there's value in the scriptures is one reason why in so many places we're losing a generation. I told you a few weeks ago that discovered faith, people brand new to Christianity, is growing through the roof all over the world. But inherited faith, that's baptizing our kids and then becoming church leaders so they can baptize their kids, is falling and falling fast. C.S. Lewis once wrote an essay where he talked about the difference between dating a virgin and dating a divorcee. And he said the divorcee has heard all the lines and knows what it feels like for someone to break them. So she's got built-in resistance and maybe even cynicism. Isn't that the West? People rejecting Christianity because they've heard all the lines. But they've met Christians. And they've been hurt by the church. That's why this series, which is coming to an end this morning, This series on worthy faith might have sounded different than most series. Less Bible verses, more outside quotes. Because I want you to be able to use these lessons to share with children who no longer have faith, or a sister who's questioning her faith, or a neighbor who told you they have no good reason to talk about faith. But I also think these lessons are needed for you and me. Some of us have skipped over those early fundamental questions, living off the fumes of a Christian family or a Christian culture. And if that's so, you're going to learn firsthand that that won't work in sharing faith with the next generation. It won't even be enough when you start to have your own faith questions. Maybe you're never going to doubt the existence of God or whether Jesus is God's son. The truth, capital T, will never be up for debate for you. But truths around the center might come up. Somebody might give you a list and say, these are the important questions and the important answers that you have to be right about to be right with God or in the right church or on the right side of history. And then you might ask, well, who made this list? Why did you pick these topics and not others? Here's an issue two Christians disagree about, both sides citing Scripture. What do I do? In my own history, I've had teachers who believe that Christians can fight in war and those who thought Christians cannot fight in war. I've had teachers who thought the Spirit dwelled in us personally and those who thought the Spirit dwelled in us representatively. I've had teachers who thought the death penalty was right and teachers who thought the death penalty was wrong. Teachers who thought vaccines should be mandated. Teachers who thought they should never be mandated. I'm talking about life and death matters. And issues about the nature of God himself. Why are we allowed to disagree about these matters, but then we can't disagree about the matters on my list? Citing book, chapter, and verse won't be enough because that's the very thing we're arguing about. Which chapters? Which verses? Take precedence and priority. How do I know that I'm reading this verse right or giving it its proper place? Historically, church has been a place for thinking people to share their curiosity, to bring their doubts, and to hash things out in conversation. Paul devoted two whole chapters of the book of Romans to this question. How do we live together? with brothers and sisters who disagree about matters where one side says, this is just a matter of opinion. Don't you understand? Get over it. And the other side says, this is a matter of doctrine. Don't you understand? We need to talk about it. And Paul says, we can do this together. 
It's why I want to tell people with doubts and concerns and questions. Let's have those discussions within the family of faith rather than seeing doubts and questions as barriers to the family of faith. We're going to have to re-examine our lists about what keeps you out, what puts me in, what makes you wrong, what makes me right. But that means questioning, challenging, rethinking, and listening. And it means being open to learning. And that's why I have always loved this definition of what Christianity is. It was put out by a monk in the 11th century. He called the Christian life faith-seeking understanding. Don't you love that phrase? I don't have faith because I figured everything out. I'm able to make sense of things because I start with faith. I don't fear learning. It's because of my faith that I eagerly seek to learn and explore and grow. The phrase faith-seeking understanding is beautiful, but it's also challenging. It means my faith should be childlike, but not childish. An unquestioning, unchallenging, non-reflective faith is the opposite of healthy. It would be faith rejecting understanding. Instead, the Lord requires intellectual honesty, real conversation. We are believers in God seeking to more fully understand God. And when we read, when we think, when we study, when we listen to new ideas, we're not just seeking ammunition or more planks to express what we already know. That would be faith seeking the opportunity to win. What we're trying to do is to know what's true. And so we ask. And so we grapple. And so we seek. And even after all of our grappling and questioning and seeking, there will be things that at the end of the day will say, I'm just not sure. Welcome to the community of faith. Certainty is not the goal of the church. Church is not a place for certainty. It's a place for confidence. Confidence in the one who has called us. Confidence in God as the source of all truth. Confidence in Jesus as the giver of all truth. Confidence in the Spirit as the one who guides us in all truth. If I was the head of the decoration committee, which I will never be, I'd put a big sign up over the door. Doubters, welcome. Let our attitude towards seekers who come here, our attitude toward one another, model the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 3. I want you to hear it as we close in an unfamiliar translation so it might hit you like it's never hit you before. We sometimes tend to think, that we know all we need to know to answer these kinds of questions, says Paul. But sometimes our humble hearts can help us more than our proud minds. We never really know enough until we recognize that God alone knows it all. It's that God who stands with his arms open wide. Don't let your doubts, your fears, your uncertainties, or your questions keep you from falling into his arms. That's where he wants those doubts to reside. His shoulders are big enough to handle it. He can take it. The great heroes of faith continued their faith journey, which was a faith struggle, the rest of their life. Let it take place within the family of faith, and your journey can begin today. We will take you as you are, but we won't leave you that way. We'll bury that old person. You'll rise to walk a new life. And together, in this community of doubters and community of faith seekers, we will find a way to put all of our questions and concerns in the right place as we're guided by God to hang on to his hand, even as we say to ourselves, I believe, help my unbelief. Thank you for joining us. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been enriched. 
And if you have any questions, any thoughts, any comments, reach out to us at prayers at wschurch.net. God bless you. Tune in next week.